for having me. I'm um, different than all the other people speaking. I'm in a private practice in a rural setting, uh, and I work almost exclusively with one really qualified table side assistant who's here in the audience. He's a physician assistant, um, which I think will uh, be reflected actually in some of our OR times. So I don't think I'd have the patience for what some of you guys do. Um, so this is where we are. Uh, Bangor is uh, north central Maine. We're a 400 bed tertiary referral center. Um, we cover the geography of uh, two thirds of the state. Uh, we started robotics in Bangor after um, the cardiac surgeons bought a robot in 2004. The cardiac program stalled and the robot was essentially parked in a corner, um, which worked out well for, for me. There were no limitations on access to the robot. There were a lot of uh, reasons I thought it would be useful for robotics and, or for bariatrics in general surgery. It's most intrigued by the um, ergonomics, having a herniated disc in my neck, um, 3D vision and wristed instruments. Um, and then I thought the probability that most advances in minimally invasive surgery would come off a robotic platform made me eager to adopt this technology. This is what we do in Bangor. About 75% of my cases are gastric bypasses. Um, a few sleeves. We have insurance issues and very few people in Maine who can pay out of pocket. And 25% bans. Uh, since we got our S system in 2009, which was our second, we got it actually at Christmas time 2008, it was our second system, 95% of my um, bypasses are done with robot. We started with um, robotic banding. Um, it's a high volume case low in complexity, short in duration, which is very useful when you're starting, it, um, really cuts down on console frustration, minimal dissection, minimal suturing, and the robot was pretty new in our hospital, and so it was a great case to practice positioning the robot, docking, and instrument changes. We then moved on to the um, GJ anastomosis. Uh, again, obviously, it's a higher complexity some tissue manipulation, you have to align your pouch and your rulim robotically, whether you go anti-colic or retrocolic. I um, agree with Dr. Sudan, mine are retrocolic, retrogastric, they're um, very untensioned anastomoses, the limb lies there very nicely. Um, you have to create your gastrotomy and anerotomy, which takes some thought, are you going to do that at the console, are you going to do that from the table, which energy source are you going to choose, we use the um, robotic harmonic. And then um, suturing. So you're going to hand, I do a hand sewn two layered uh, GJ anastomosis with 2O ethabon and 3O vicryl. Uh, for the same reasons, the colors, uh, it's easier to delineate what you're doing and um, they have uh, nice handling properties. But you're also going to have an anerotomy to close whether it's a linear or circular stapled anastomosis. And then positioning um, the arms takes some practice. Where do you want your arms to sit um, with the robot coming over the patient's head so that you have adequate range of motion to um, so comfortably. And just finishing the anterior layer, serosa layer. We use the um, suture cut needle driver, which I didn't see in other people's videos, but it's another time saver. Um, you can cut your own suture instead of waiting for someone to come in with a scissor. Did you, did you when you were learning that, did you have problems of accidentally cutting your suture? I, I accidentally suture? turned me off. <laughs> Thanks. Um, not the so much. Cut. I think the, um, the big black bar, I think the instrument's well designed and that black bar is pretty clear. I, you'll see a third hand come in there every time to cinch my suture, um, so I'm never getting the suture in the jaw. We actually do that for two reasons. Without tactile sense, it's hard to, to cinch your own um, running suture line. You'll either break your suture or it'll be loose. You, know, you, you can't tell. Um, and then the other is is to not, to not cut it. That's a pretty well designed instrument. Um, and then we moved on to creating our RULIM um, and, and then our, obviously our JJ anastomosis. And what we found most challenging about the small bowel portion of the surgery is actually the extensive tissue manipulation without tactile sense. Um, and the tiny delay from when you let go of instruments in the console and when they actually let go in the patient, it took some practice running the bowel um, without uh, causing any kind of serosal defects. You then have to divide the small bowel safely, and this is where your table side assistant is so critical. You're going to lie the bowel out, and they need to understand to put the stapler straight down the mesentery, measuring the roux, and then aligning your limbs for your enterotomies. And again, you've got to create those enterotomies and decide on energy source, wristed or not wristed instrumentation for that. The jejunojejunostomy, we use a 45 millimeter linear stapler. I had a bad experience with a 60, and so I still use the 45. 
um, two fires uh, to get a lengthy enteroenterostomy. And then you're going to have a residual defect, which you can either sew, and we sewed quite a few of them. This is a nice place to practice sewing since it's a, you know, a, a lower risk um, suture line. Uh, we now just approximate the two edges, hold them up, and staple this closed, and we haven't had any problems with strictures in our JJs. Uh, we, we sew all our mesenteric defects, which you'll see next, uh, again with the robot, and uh, we spent a fair amount of time practicing arm position because oftentimes your small bowel will be headed towards your pelvis, uh, particularly if you're in somatified or moderate reverse Trendelenburg. Um, and your range of motion on your arms can make it challenging. So you need to learn to manipulate the tissue to bring it where you can reach it, and your table side uh, help needs to be able to put the arms where you can get the most amount of reach. We're finishing our, uh, enter, or our mesenteric closure. So we did um, all of these steps uh, independently um, before putting the whole thing together. Um, working in private practice, I didn't want to turn a, uh, you know, an hour and a half long operation into six hours. Um, so we were able to get our skill set uh, and then move on to doing the whole thing with the robot. This is um, a schematic of our port placement. I also use the Nathanson livery tractor placed at the subxiphoid location. I use an extra long peri umbilical trocar with our really thick abdominal walls and the amount of trocar used by the camera arm. We found that the port would often pull out of the peritoneal cavity, so we switched to a longer, a longer trocar. We use two subcostal trocars with the left one being a little lower than the right so that you can reach down to the, pel uh, down to the small bowel and up to the stomach. Um, and then the assistance trocar is in the, the right abdomen out of the line of action between the right subcostal trocar and the camera so that they can access that trocar and be out of the way of the arms. We use five trocars for laparoscopy as well. This looks very much like our configuration for laparoscopic bypass. There's a picture of the trocar placement we marked before we prep. The uh, cart position, um, this is modified over time, just like I heard from many people. We started um, positioning the cart twice. The patient is in moderate reverse Trendelenburg. We keep the arms out, uh, not like this schematic, and um, I stand on the patient's uh, right side, the assistant on the left, to start the case. Now we then bring the robot in. Initially, we brought him way over to the left to do the small bowel portion with the patient relatively flat and then undocked and positioned over the head with the patient at moderate reverse Trendelenburg to do the um, gastrojejunostomy. Uh, we use a 30 degree angle down camera throughout the operation. We too found it tedious to move the robot twice. We did the first oh, 200 of these with the standard system so it wasn't motorized. There's a lot of cart moving. Um, so we've switched, we, we've moved now to a position over the left shoulder that isn't perfect for either operation but adequate for, for either part of the operation but adequate for both. So how do you decide you're ready? You obviously need a surgeon who's comfortable with the skill set. Need a table side assistant. You've heard other people mention this. The guy at the table really needs to understand your operation. And I think those are some of the frustrations you guys have in the teaching setting. Um, you know, I've got the same two people assisting me in all my cases. So they know what the operation's supposed to look like. They know where we want the staplers to be. They know what suture I want before I ask for it. Um, I've great help. Uh, you need a robotic scrub or somebody who knows how to change your instruments and change them safely because you really don't want to see those instruments flying in like crazy because they'll drive them right through something important, liver, spleen, uh, colon. Um, so you want them to do it quickly but safely. Same thing with your circulators. If they don't know how to switch you from laparoscopy to the robotic system, it's just a lot of time wasted and it's very frustrating. Um, and your anesthesia team has to be comfortable managing your high-risk airways and your morbidly obese patients with a robot draped over their head. This is what our cases look like. We didn't uh, select out a specific population to get started. Our first 30 robotic bypasses starting in 2005 look very much like our last 30 bypasses. Our average age, um, average body mass, and male to female ratios are essentially the same. 